He's infected! No! No! Get him! Um, <laughs> all right. The... Welcome back, everybody, to the Transcriptions YouTube channel. Today, we're doing a special Halloween edition of, well, we're gonna react to a few horror films, I believe. Dr. Ted, do you like horror films? You're looking at one. Oh, wow, wow. Okay, Dr. Ted is our Chief Science and Technology Officer at Transcriptions. I'm Boomer Anderson, Chief Executive Officer. Today, we're gonna play a little game, uh, starting with a film that I believe was early 90s, uh, 28 Days Later. We're gonna talk a little bit about can these viruses, bacteria, things replicate in a fashion that could take over the world? And how would that happen? Or if not, what are other potential ways that we can see ourselves in somewhat of a pandemic again? Let's get going, shall we? We shall. All right. I'm gonna get you out of here. The animals are contagious. One bite. Stop. Stop. You have no idea. And there it goes. So I want to pause for a moment for human stupidity. You have scientists here who have clearly indicated that the monkey is infected and now the monkey is, I believe, eating this individual. Um, There'd be no plot if she doesn't get bitten, right? Yeah. But if you really want to get serious with the science of this one, these are called zoonoses, right? So there are viruses that are in animals that can transfer to humans by biting, by mosquito bites. In fact, mosquitoes biting the animals and biting us. You know, these are well known in history. Uh, human immunodeficiency virus, there's an equivalent in, in monkeys, semen immunodeficiency virus. So let's Hollywoodize this whole thing and make it more dramatic. But this is exactly the point of transfer, right? The day before the TV and radio stopped broadcasting, there were reports of infection in Paris and New York. No, there's of course so it's, it's, okay. serious. Okay, okay. I want to pause yeah, right here for a second and talk about if a viral infection were to occur or a zombie apocalypse, do you think it would occur in a large city or a rural town? Well, it depends on where the source is, certainly the distance from. Sure. Right? Okay, that's the easy way to answer the question. Um, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> Uh, it has a bearing on us mm -hmm. as human beings, right? For example, when we started doing agriculture and animal husbandry, we started clustering together mm -hmm. and stopped moving around like uh, nomads that we were. So what happened there is we had problems of sanitation. We have to poop outside, we have to do all these things, but we're clustered together, so infections arose. And so we had uh, a lot of uh, other diseases uh, that came up that were not present. It's the same thing, reasoning that you can apply here. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you and I have talked about before, and this became particularly prevalent in 2019, 2020, was the idea of pandemics and viral replication, bacterial replication, whatever you want to say, being something that will continually occur as the planets get warmer. Can we talk a little bit about just the climate change hypothesis towards viruses and bacteria and how it might affect Yeah, I actually proposed it several years ago and I actually saw it written up. I was uh, postulating that the global ice caps are, were melting uh, at a rate that we have not seen before. You know, uh, glaciers, you know, even in Argentina, mm -hmm. uh, they're one of their national monuments just crashed. And then you could see Greenland, right? Uh, these uh, icebergs uh, that were just part of the permafrost before uh, actually detaching. So those are actually releasing viruses and bacteria that our epoch has not seen. We don't know where that will get. It will get into a water supply, our food chain, you know, uh, food supply, and then may infect us. We don't know what the long-term effects are going to be. Mm -hmm. right? So that's where I think some uh, situation like this, where it's actually urgent for us to take a look at the anthropocentric uh, climate change that we're doing, right? We're heating up the earth very rapidly and what we're doing to the water that's actually in there, keeping them cryogenically preserved, right? And this is the resurrection and that's probably a cause of, uh, maybe a cause of a, a zombie apocalypse for us. Okay. Uh-oh, the crap. Oh no, one drop of blood. Of course it went in the eye and like couldn't have landed anywhere else. And the first person yeah, he sees is his daughter. Okay, Keep away from me, Dad! Keep away from me! Keep away from me! Keep away from me! Oh, that behavioral change was so quick. Keep away from me! 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 Keep away from
patient zero, right, mm -hmm. in, in any outbreak. That's how we got into Cayetan Dugas in HIV, right? Mm -hmm. Epidemiologists usually try to start where it came from. And there are many conspiracy theories on how coronavirus came about. Believe what you want, right? But, you know, there's always that search for patient zero. Where did it first occur? Mm -hmm. Was it a zoonosis? So did it transfer from from uh, animal to human, or was it something else, right? So, um, and things like this, you know, once you, <laughs> once you this is identifying a patient zero, for example, if that were patient zero, that's identifying and killing patient zero and there would be no contagion at all. Yeah, so exactly, uh, the patient zero and who the patient zero particularly is ultimately dictates how big of an issue this beco mm -hmm. becomes, right? You related it to particularly HIV at one point. And so in particular, this person's lifestyle Mm. was one of the reasons why it was able to spread so rapidly mm -hmm. so fast, right? Yeah. <laughs> nice base. Everybody has a baseball bat. I love it. All of these guys are also featured in many K-dramas. So zombies that can't see in the dark. This seems to be a little bit contradictory to our traditional zombie flick. How do you feel about that? The different plots for zombies, right? Well, first, there's a classical definition of the zombie, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is like the living dead, right? And then we transformed it to someone who is infected, but it's not dead. So it's like there's this conflation of two different things, right? Uh, one is supposed to be dead already, but still walking around. That's a real definition of a zombie. Right? And then they are not dead, they're infected, but their behavior has changed. Mm -hmm. And that's a different uh, kind of zombie. You're getting zombified by an external organism or something like that. You're still alive, technically. So <laughs> I, I'm going to ask a question that probably uh, there might not be an answer to because we haven't really faced a zombie apocalypse yet that I know of, or it's been erased from our history. And what likelihood of recovery from a zombie type virus infection, probably higher in somebody who is alive and infected, right? Than somebody who's already dead. <laughs> the yeah. other one is uh, probably not a probability, right? Yeah. So, so um, the thing here, here is more important is like, have you found anyone who survived the infection? And that's why in many of these stories, they rush to find the antidote, right? Which is usually an antibody that actually fights the virus and you're well in like 48 hours or 12 hours. It, it doesn't work that fast. You mm -hmm. have to, this is a, you know, the drip that has to uh, occur over several hours because the body cannot mount an immune system that quickly. So you mean to tell me that I cannot construct an entire immune system within 10 minutes? Something like that. Okay. No, you can't. Before you get sick, your immune system goes to war for several days, right? Until you actually succumb to it. So this is actually, we're going to take this back to the nonprofit. <laughs> the important message here is even in a zombie apocalypse, it's probably good to have a good <laughs> immune system first. Absolutely. Right. It starts with your gut, but anyway. All right. <laughs> this one started with an infection, I believe in Seoul or North Korea, I can't remember. And it got passed on and everybody went to Korea's second city to survive. So let's march along now. Uh, I'd go to Jeju Island, actually. Yeah, it, I feel like that's hit or miss, right? You go to an island, if nobody's infected, it's paradise. Yeah. If one person gets infected, I'm gonna use your favorite phrase, you're fucked. Exactly. <laughs> Hamburger. Ooh, it looks delicious mm. and nutritious. They have to show the DNA. Is that you a, don't see that. Yeah, I was gonna say, that doesn't actually look. Up, and he knocks it over. Alert status. Air qualifiers indicate corrosive fumes. Oh, this is sort of like no different from when I delivered a syphilitic baby and my my gloves actually. Um... Okay, we're gonna pause there on syphilis. <laughs> All right, so speaking of syphilis, you've obviously spent so much more time in a hospital than I have. And part of your background that people may not know. Not really a good background. <laughs> but but you had... Spending so much time in a hospital. Oh, well, that creates an experience which ultimately helps shape where you are today. And let's talk about little... what fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I was, I trained at the hospital we were in a poor country where we had to recycle gloves. And so the gloves were brittle. That's and like stage, step one of hygiene. <laughs> so I double gloved, yeah. right? And then, uh, holy fuck, as I, 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 you know, I delivered the baby and I was suturing the episiotomy, I noticed that, you know, my gloves were nicked. So right after that, the, the one uh, that we go to is the head nurse of uh, pediatrics bringing our penicillin. And then she would go, not a good way to catch syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is another moral of the story, don't double bag. Uh, <laughs> is that a brain? 
extraordinary one. What are those lies? Oh, that guy made a comeback as Punisher. It's a person's life. All oh, right. Yeah. Experiences, memories. Somewhere in all that organic I wish it water, were simple, all right? those. It's not that easy to, I believe, map memories. Maybe through an MRI. Everything you ever were yeah, let's talk. Ever let's talk be. a little bit about MRIs because you have a unique perspective on MRIs, as in you worked on <laughs> the original one. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I worked on the software of the original one. So yeah. let's let's talk about MRIs, what they can and can't do. Because here you have a doctor who claims that uh, an MRI can capture the memories, the thoughts of a person. That's MRIs. A, that's a thoroughly advanced MRI. Uh, what we measure in MRI, what we can measure now is what we call bold, right? Blood oxygen uh, levels. And so when you see a particular area of the brain increase in blood flow, then you know that it's active. Right? So that's the level by which you can tease out things. But the actual pathway lighting up, you actually need a dye to do that, uh, that attaches to like neurotransmitters and so on. And for now, I don't think there's any human that's being subjected to that. We do. So sub we're not going gadolinium. We, <laughs> we're, we're, we we can subject monkeys, and and you know, from people from PETA will actually hit you for that. But uh, right now, there is no other way uh, to do that. So we're actually advancing uh, AI simulations of these things to see whether or not we could approximate how the pathway actually works and represent them like this. Oh. Oh. Uh oh. Oh, Brad Pitt, so dreamy. Mm. Yeah. I think he sliced the he sliced the arm off. The, the one that's infected, man. The idea here that Brad Pitt employed was they got bit on their finger mm. and therefore if I cut the hand off, it wouldn't make it up the bloodstream mm. fast enough and therefore they There's a recent okay. fraternity case in Boy Scouts, right? You get yeah. bitten by a snake, but you don't you, chop off the arm. Okay, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> there probably was an easier way to do this, but Brad went for full brutality here. Would the better approach simply have been to put the tourniquet around the arm, tie it tight Well, it depends on how the virus spreads, mm -hmm. right? And uh, for blood, if you can uh, apply the tourniquet high enough, and fast enough, then you could probably just prevent the, the spread that way rather than chopping off the arm. So in the case of snakes, what is fast enough? Because let's say- No, fast enough is, uh, you know, depending on how uh, venomous yeah. the, the bite is. So black so, mamba, you're still kind yeah, of screwed. Right? You're, yeah, you're still screwed. It's the same here, you know, viral infections, you know, I'm not a virologist, but this is thought in uh, basic virology uh, to us is that you have an inoculation period, you know, after a bite, uh, for example, of malaria or dengue or anything like that, uh, there's an inoculation period of the virus. And there's certain people that just wouldn't get infected in the case of dengue or malaria. And, and then, by the way, malaria is not a virus. Mm. It's, a, it's a trophocyte. Minor correction there. Dengue is a virus. Okay, so we're in a freeze lab. Of course, everything is frozen. Hmm. Not that one. Not that one. Nice. Ooh. We have no idea which one's gonna work. No, there are just really some basic principles that you follow, right? But if you're out of options, you just do empirical testing. Oh. Okay. And so he just injected himself, waited a couple of minutes. <laughs> I mean, we've kind of seen this with vaccines and things, but did the results happen that quickly? Not really. Yeah. These things take time. They take a lot of observation, a lot of trials. Since this is illness medicine, you know, statistically, it should work on a majority of the population, not just one. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and and equals one is for biohackers. But you need to have uh, actually enroll thousands of people to see whether or not the vaccination would work. No, mankind has been at war with the virus from the start. Sometimes millions of people die as in. It's actually a wrong state. But in the end, we always win. All right, since you have uh, mankind has been at a vi war with the virus from the start is it mankind yeah, versus if you, himself if you inspect our, our dna we actually have lots of dna fragments that are actually coming from viruses mm -hmm. we have not been at war with viruses we have been in 
in, uh, relationship. in, in relationship with them mm -hmm. since the beginning of time, even before we were humans. So we are just uh, considering them as enemies or our enemies because we're considering ourselves separate from them. But if you take a look at our DNA structure, you can see that, all, that many of our stretches of DNA actually come from viruses. Uh, but you, uh, just to be clear, you, you do think microorganisms pose a threat? Oh, Pretty anymore. interesting Diet. conclusion here that bacteria. this guy's got. No. No. Not bacteria, not viruses, so fungus. Where do we get LSD from? Where do you get it from? Oh, that ergot, right? Yeah. Boom. Shout out Albert Hoffman. It comes from ergot, a fungus. There's a fungus that infects insects, gets inside an ant, for example, it travels oh, through its circulatory system to the ant's brain and then floods it with hallucinogens, yada, thus yada, yada, yada. bending the ant's mind to its will. Fungus starts to or is the ant just high? Uh, so for <laughs> those of you watching this right now, this is The Last of Us starring Pedro Pascal, who is probably one of the most famous actors in Hollywood now. So famous that they haven't been able to shoot season two. The end conclusion here was that cordyceps, uh, and I don't recall if it was cordyceps militaris or something else, has the ability to potentially take over the human mind. We then go from this interview into a situation where the cordyceps mushroom takes over the human mind. So Dr. Ted, hmm. cordyceps. People hmm. are putting in their coffee. Are we now slave to cordyceps? Or I hope are so. we? I'm kidding. <laughs> it might be a, they might be a it, good it, it might, If it induces uh, optimal health behaviors in you, why not? And cordyceps actually uh, is a spore that lands on the ant, right? Uh, and then they penetrate the exoskeleton of the ant, and then uh, they grow inside uh, in, inside the ant. And uh, the ant, uh, they produce chemicals that alter the ant's behavior that makes it seek a place in the plant where that's uh, neither high nor low, right humidity, right temperature for the fungus to grow. So in other words, it programs the ant to go to a place where I can grow, right? And then uh, it gets into a death grip. It grips it so that it doesn't fall. Right, and then it dies that way, and the uh, fungus consumes it, uh, uses it for food, right, and then it sporulates again, and it, you go into a new cycle. Mm -hmm. Could we see a progression whereby eventually cordyceps is able to take over the world? Is this well, just where is it gonna land? <laughs> I mean, it's able to penetrate the exoskeleton of the ant. No, the, you have to take a look at what the evolutionary uh, mechanism is here. Again, right? The uh, the mechanism is to reproduce, and we are actually a good body for fungal reproduction, like Candida is fungus mm. it reproduces in us, right? But um, there is also a certain uh, type of uh, what I call finickiness, according to what they where they want to grow. Like for example, uh, Cordyceps only wants to grow at a particular height of tree at a particular temperature, a particular humidity, right? Which it cannot find in the human body. So only particular types of fungus will grow actually inside us. And some of us will, won't probably be able to grow them at all um, because, hey, we probably they probably hate um, cakes and you eat a lot of cake. Mm. Right? You may be but dead. on the other hand, Candida loves cake, right? <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's why you see diabetics uh, with lots of uh, uh, fungal infection with uh, Candida, right? So, so correction. Fungal is infestation. Not infection, Not infestation. infestation. So uh, cordyceps mushroom has been used in traditional Chinese medicine for a very long time. Mm -hmm. We actually have a lot of practitioners mm -hmm. that use it to give people energy. Mm -hmm. The most active compound within cordyceps is cordycepin. Right. So one of kind of differentiate between the two of those, like cordyceps, what that could be used for, and then cordycepin. Let's go into that. Cordycepin uh, is actually the active molecule that's found in the cordyceps military fungus, right? Uh, that's the reason why it's very expensive, right? Because you have to isolate, essentially you extract it from the cordyceps military fungus, and then that's the pure ingredient that you now can put into a product. So when you use the actual uh, mushroom, say it has only like 2% cordycepin, you might need like 7.2 grams of the mushroom to powder and grind every day in order to approximate a pure cordycepin uh, formula. And you need very high levels of those to achieve neuroprotection and, you know, uh, cancer fighting properties, uh, you know, increasing oxygen uh, carrying capacity and, and so on. I want to take everybody back to probably this time last year. And I got one of these late night text messages from Dr. Ted that was like, can you find this? And he sends a, a link of text that is probably three pages long. You were so excited. Mm -hmm. to discover the additional properties of cordyceps right. and to go through a lot more, or you found more literature essentially, because we were initially using cordyceps in TROZ. Uh, TROZ, our sleep formula. To promote deep sleep. Promote yeah. deep sleep, yeah. partial adenosine agonists, yes. help yeah. you get to sleep yeah. as well. 
but there were some additional properties there that you just said like, holy shit, we need to find more of this. And so yeah. cordyceps is featured in Trozy. Again, mm -hmm. we use that as the partial adenosine agonist. It mm -hmm. enhances mm -hmm. deed sleep. And then Tromune mm -hmm. and soon to be Tropluspune. Yeah. And yeah. let's just recap for everybody the, the key benefits there that why you'd consider this for immune system regulation. Well, the first one is, is a very potent anti-inflammatory, right? Uh, rather than taking Advil or or um, Tylenol all the time. You know, why not take something that actually addresses uh, total body inflammation at the same time has proven studies for neuroprotection, right? If you, especially if you're like me, who's concerned about getting older and having cognitive decline. <sighs> I hope not. But anyway, um, you know, here's something that you could take consistently. And my initial finding from it was enhancing deep, deep sleep. So in my formulations, I formulated uh, Trozy for myself because my deep sleep was like two minutes, three minutes, five minutes every night. Yeah, so with addition of cordyceps and just at 40 milligrams, you know, you could see my deep sleep go to an hour. So that's consistent uh, for that. Other things that it does on uh, actually higher doses is that it, it exhibits its anti-cancer properties, right? Uh, it also prevents what's called mast cell degranulation, which is it releases histamine, causes asthma and allergies and so on. So all of these studies were there. It's like, what's not to love? Mm. And I said, oh, it's the price. But <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're on the hunt for that one. Yeah. Um, but, but for me, when I formulate something that will affect behavior, right? The first thing that I really do is to uh, provide neuroprotection. And this one, uh, you know, does it. Um, you know, I was so skeptical because it's like, yeah, this is too good to be true. But then if you dig far enough, you could see uh, all of these studies have already been done with it. And done not just with the cordyceps mushroom, done with cordyceps in itself. Right. All right. So, Dr. Ted, we want to wrap up here with this Halloween edition of, uh, well, really a reflection on zombie apocalypses. Mm -hmm. Can they happen? What are the sort of the mechanisms by which they may happen? And clearly, we're just having a lot of fun and a typhoon's happening right behind us. I want to wrap up with one question for you. Of these zombie movies that mm -hmm. we've gone into today, mm -hmm. do you have a favorite? No, because the real zombie uh, apocalypse is actually happening now. And it's happening symbolically with the rise of social media. All of these memes actually infect our brains and affect our behavior. And the worst part of it is we're unaware that it's happening. And the term meme here you're using is not necessarily a graphic with words on it. It's more of Richard Dawkins. Usually. Richard, yes, genetic and memetic. Those are the original meanings of genes and memes, right? Not, not the, the bastardized way that the internet has it now. Okay, so everything that you read, etc., affects your behavior, affects your outlook, and you have a fucked up life. So. <laughs> In the spirit of mimetic invasion, let's wrap things up. Everybody, enjoy your Halloween. Enjoy your trick or treating. Remember, it's probably not good to consume too much sugar. And if you do, what do we give them? Berberine? Uh, lipoic acid. There you go. Yeah. So, from Dr. Ted and Boomer, it's transcriptions. Enjoy your Halloween.